So uh, I'm taking you guys see these slides at real time going by. Yep. Yeah. Sure slides do. now. Yep. So I just threw, I threw this one and this is a Capsi map showing you where heartworms are. I uh, wanted to point out that these are not shelter dogs. These are dogs that actually go to a veterinarian, so we're assuming that they're sort of under somebody's care. And basically, nationally, out of the 8 million samples from 2012 and 2013 uh, that were tested for heartworm, one out of every 86 dogs seeing a veterinarian is positive. Okay, so it is sad because we have a prevent. Wow. Okay. Some of you have may have forgotten that in 2004, veterinarians got a letter that said, by the way, revolution doesn't work very well for heartworm prevention. Yes, okay, it was sent to every veterinarian in the United States of America. And if you didn't believe me because I said that, here's the actual copy of the letter that was sent to these veterinarians It says the same thing. <laughs> then we had Victoria Hampshire who did a paper in 2005 that was presented at the uh, AAVP meeting saying that she was seeing all these uh, lack of efficacy in the southern United States. And so that was the first real strong hint by somebody uh, that this was going on. Then what happened is Victoria and all other folks at the FDA got horribly embroiled in the fight over ProHeart 6 and its recall, and that basically pulled their attention away from the uh, heartworm thing, and it was, it was, people were getting fired, people were, she's, she left the FDA, became a whistleblower. She, she's a whistleblower site, uh, so it was a huge brouhaha over the over the ProHeart 6 stuff, and unfortunately that pulled their eyes off the resistance issue at the time. <laughs> I thought I'd just jump right in and tell you about the lab-based studies relative to preventive failures. You have to understand when heartworms are tested, this is how it's done. Basically what you do is you give the experimentally infected dogs, 30 to 100 third stage larvae, you wait 30 days and you treat because you said you're gonna give the drug once a month so you have to let the worms be at least a month old. Then you wait five months and then you do the necropsy. And whether you like it or not, there's a requirement that dogs be necropsy for all your products, okay? <laughs> and people will tell you this not true, but it is true, okay? Uh, if it's not 100%, there's not a product, okay? I killed a product and I know a company which is actually gone from planet Earth because they had a worm in a dog, okay? Wow. <laughs> so, development of trifexis and the introduction of MP3, so this is what happened. Uh, Dan Snyder, uh, who works for Elanco, came up with the trifexis, and I'm gonna ignore all the trifexis stuff which is raising, uh, raging in the background which some of you may have heard about, okay? I'm not sure. There's supposedly some dog deaths associated with trichosis, which we're going to ignore today. I thought some of your audience may have read about this in the AVMA news right now. It's big stuff. I don't think it's, if you read it, I'm not sure it's related, but nonetheless, okay? Um, so part of the, they were working on a new drug, and they did two studies, <laughs> and they used two isolates. The FDA requires that you do two tests. They used to require three, but it's getting harder and harder to get three, so they now require only two isolates and they require two isolates from different places in the United States because what they are after, if you have to do experimental infections, is they're after genetically different worms, okay, not, uh, so that's what it's, it's kind of, they're mainly trained in chicken and cattle where resistance is common. So that's what, one of the things they're targeting, okay? Um, and so in one of them it was 100%, and the other one it was not, okay? So now what that meant was, and this is just showing you the number, what that meant was this product was dead. It's not going to go anywhere, right? I told you it had to be 100%. However, this was milbomycin oxime, which is already in Sentinel and Interceptor. And so he said, Dan Snyder and Elanco said, that they don't work anymore either. Okay? So they took this, they took HeartGuard and they took, uh, uh, it, uh, they took HeartGuard and they took, Heart, uh, interceptor, and they found one worm in one dog in each group, but that was enough for them to let them go ahead. But the FDA said, no, just because they don't work doesn't mean you don't have to be 100%. Okay? So then they had to take that same one again, and they did it at 30 days and 60 days, and they still had a worm. Okay, so thank they you. 
So then they had to bump it up to, they had 60 days, at 90 days they did not, okay? So that's why it says you have to have at least three months of trifexis. Okay, that's why it's <laughs> Then Blackburn came along and did a study, okay, which was presented at NABC in 2011, okay? And he did a study, it was, it was funded by Bayer, and basically this slide's easier to see. This is the actual table, so I put it over here. And so what he did in this study was he had eight dogs in each group, one dog. The trials are done the same. You infect them, you wait a month, okay, you give them the pill, you give them the topical, you give them the whatever, okay, and then you count the worms. You with me on that one? So that's what he did. And as you can see, with HeartGuard, we're using this same one, he had... Uh, po seven positive dogs with uh, Interceptor he had seven positive dogs with Revolution he had seven positive dogs with Malta he didn't have any and the untreated he had eight and so basically he, uh, he didn't have many worms in these positive okay uh, but he had worms in these positive dogs and the efficacy was uh, <coughs> he only protected 12.5 percent but the worms were such that he had fairly decent efficacy if those numbers aren't right so far, okay yeah. 2.3. Okay, they're 2.3 versus okay. the decimal points in the wrong places. 2.3, 2.4, and 2.3. Okay? Somebody typed this one. I think it was me. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> then we had a. Uh, we also have Sandal Spectrum, which you may not know anything about because it's approved but not sold. So what they did was they added Proziquantel to Sentinel. So that's what's happened there. Uh, and Basically now, if this has a six month, six consecutive monthly label on it, and basically what the, they found is one month didn't work and two months didn't work, and then rather than doing three months, they skipped straight to six months. So they have a six month label. Okay. So st with MP3, this strain, we had nine trials where uh, dogs were infected in spite of being given a single treatment. One with Trifexis, two with HeartGuard Plus, two with Interceptor, one with Revolution, and two with Ivermectin uh, in a product undergoing development. Bear was working on a product. They told me this. One of them, was, it was actually talked about in one of the papers. One was given at the regular HeartGuard dose. They were going for an oral, okay? And the other one was given at one and a half the HeartGuard dose. And I've heard you talk about this before. Does everybody understand what MP3 is? It's not a music. Yeah, MP3 stands for Miss Piggy. Okay, it's a dog from Georgia. We'll talk more, okay? And then there were two studies where this isolate, uh, two treatments did not do it in. Then, in July this past year at the AAVP meeting, okay, we had some more talks today. Alaski from Louisiana State, working with Jack Malone and Tom Cly, who are the parasitologists down there, took Mike Fleur from two dogs in Louisiana. They had a history of efficacy failure with full monetary compensation, so that was a requirement, so the company paid. They were located in an area of quote-unquote hot spot failure, okay? They had microflare persistent seven days after they gave them a macro, uh, microflaricidal dose of ivermectin. Basically, that meant they gave an oral dose of 50 micrograms per kilogram ivermectin, and they still had microflare, and they checked their molecular markers that we'll talk about later up at McGill and found out that they seemed to have markers which were indicative of resistance. Okay. She put them into a new dog, as third stage, so she grew them up mosquitoes, she infected two dogs, and she gave these dogs the maximum, if you think about dose bands, you can have six to 12 micrograms of ivermectin for preventive dose, and 12 would be if you're the smallest weight for your dose band. So if it's for 10 to 20 pounds and you're at 10 pounds, you're gonna get the 12. So that's what they did here, and they just used oral ivermectin, and basically she gave it month after month after month until and after patency, and both, so these got monthly dose, and both dogs got infected, each with a different eye. There was no necropsy involved here, okay? Dr. Blackburn at Auburn has been collecting isolates for Novartis Corporation for a number of years. Okay, from all around the Delta region. So he gets them in, he does this, he gets them into culture, he has an in vitro assay that he uses, we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's passed them from dog to dog, uh, and he has these characterized strains. 
Ronald Kaminsky at Novartis. This, this work was paid for Novart, by uh, Novartis, and Kaminsky in uh, Switzerland at their laboratory did the study. He used a strain called TV2008, and basically had 15 to 16 dogs that were treated monthly with ivermectin parental, and they had, that was heart guard plus, and they had worms at necropsy. 15 out of 16 dogs, okay? And once again, this is all corporate stuff. He was pushed to present it, and the big cheeses didn't want to present it, so it's quite vague, okay, what was actually presented. But basically, they got monthly product, and they still got infected. He did other studies where he had worms and dogs that got revolution, interceptor, and uh, advantage multi as well. I did a study here with uh, on basically ProHeart 6, and basically that's different. You treat the dogs, you wait six months, and then you give them the worms. It's backwards, because you're saying the drug's going to be there for six months, and so therefore you got to protect for six months. This had been done previously in two dose confirmation studies. These are requirements that have a lot more dogs in them than I had here. But basically, if you look... What they did was they gave 0 0.06, 0 0.17, and 0 0.50 milligrams pro heart per kilogram, uh, uh, per kilogram, and then they did it. They did it twice, and basically what you do is these studies all take a year, until so you wait. And so they had eight dogs per group, and basically they had in one study they had 25 adult diametists from the control group, and in the other study in the controls they had none. I mean, in the treated ones, they had none. And in the other study, they had some worms in one dog in the low-dose group, which is one-third of the dose that they chose, because they chose that mid-level dose. So I did the same thing. I only had four dogs. I had four dogs treated with ProHeart 6, two dogs in the controls. Everything else is just exactly the same. And then we can skip all this. I got them from Dr. Blagger. Oh, it's JD 2009 from Earl, Arkansas. Uh, Dr. Harrington here grew the, uh, grew the larvae up, and basically we had uh, <coughs> basically no difference. They were not protected at all by the ProHeart 6. Okay. Remember before, they were all protected except one dog at one-third the dose initially. Okay. So basically the efficacy was 14%. <coughs> then the American Heart Society meeting happened. Uh, in September, uh, and we have JYD34 showed up. So JYD34, like MP3, was just gone out in the field and grabbed. Okay, this dog came from Missouri. Okay, they went out and got one. MP3's from Georgia, nowhere near the Mississippi Delta. Okay, they just went out and got a dog. Keatsville, Missouri is where it came from, and they... The, the, the study, first study had five groups. They gave one group heart guard plus three months, one group trifexis three months, one group revolution three months, and then, as you can tell, it was paid for by Bayer. They got a single treatment of Advantage Malta. And they were happy as could be because, uh, this is backwards as well, 100%, none of the, that's right, it's, none of the dogs were protected against, by heart guard, none were protected against trifexis. They all had worms except for the dogs that got multi, okay? Then they did another study, because you have to do two studies often, so they did another study with JYD at McCall's laboratory in Georgia, and basically now he had a dog with worms, okay? So as we saw with the study by Kaminsky that was reported vaguely, uh, there was also a failure with, J with advantage multi. So there's not a product out there that has not been faced with a product failure. Now, this is only one treatment. The other ones had three treatments, but nonetheless, that's what happened. Okay, those are the studies out there. There are actually a few more that are drifting around in the unspoken world of bubble speak, okay, that's out there. So there's some more failures that have gone on, but that's the stuff you hear about in elevators and that isn't really real, and nobody's actually published it yet, and you may never hear about it. Okay, <clears throat> so preventives are not designed, remember, to suppress microflares and human flare infections. If preventive doses are given to dogs with existing infections, the microflare are not suppressed, and many microflare live. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a study done looking at early on. These are three dogs that were given heart guard. 
Okay, one dog, the Mike Flurry, did not go away, and the other two dogs that started lower, the Mike Flurry did go away. Okay, these are the raw counts. These are the same counts showing by log transformation. Okay, just showing you, it makes it look like they drop a lot faster. And then I use, I like to use square roots. Okay, so if you think over here, we have at 100 is 10,000, 200 is 40,000, and 300 is 90,000 Mike Flurry per ml. The reason I like it is because uh, two things. One is I don't have to add one to things when I do math and get all confused. And then the other thing is, because is, uh, I have to remember to take it out, and the other thing is the fact that uh, it makes it so I can see the tails better. It's not as uh, sharp of a drop. Okay, you'll see it matters. If you look at this graph, we have days on the bottom. They all go from 0 to 400. Okay, and then the lines at 0, 30, and 60, you see those numbers at the top? That's the day these animals were treated. So these dogs were treated three times on day 0, 30, and 60 with heart guard, and that's the, and one dog, they went away, two dogs, they went away, one dog, they didn't go away at all, okay? I got involved in a clinical trial. This was a, what happened was early on in 92, they had a, a war raging between interceptor and heart guard because they said uh, heart guard doesn't kill microflurry, Okay, an interceptor does, and if you switch to interceptor, you're going to have to use an antigen test, and if you continue using heart guard, you can still do a NOTS test. Okay. And so Novartis paid me to take these dogs and give them drugs and see what happened. And so it was SIBA back then, okay, SIBA Geige Corporation. And so we took these dogs, we gave them a, a consistent treatment, and so here we, these are the uh, untransformed counts, but as you see, these are the log counts, so everything looks unbelievably weird, and you don't really have a zero, but these are square roots. Okay, and as you can see, with heart guard, when you treat them on day zero, most of them went down, but they didn't disappear. You see that? They don't all go to zero. And this is interceptor. And if you guys can tell me there's any difference between these graphs, okay, there isn't any difference between those graphs. We didn't believe it. We knew it wouldn't be believed, so we ran out and tried to do it again. We got more dogs. These were shelter dogs. We got more dogs and did it again. Uh, and as you can see, they didn't all go away, okay? But they went down. And we did, it. here's six interceptor treatments, we tried that one, and as you, they went down with that one as well. They didn't, other folks didn't believe it, because they didn't want to believe it, and so Mary Al paid uh, Charlie Courtney in Florida to repeat the study. So he did the same thing, he had less lower counts to start with, okay, and I don't have his individual data points, I've asked Charlie Ford, he just doesn't have his data anymore, okay? But uh, as you can see, they both went down. So these are just means. But these are the actual numbers. And as you can see, after 10 treatments, 20% of the ivermectin dogs and 40% of the milbamycin dogs still had circulating, I think there were 14 dogs per group or something, or 12. 40% uh, of the, the animals still had circulating microfilaria. So are we getting too little? I don't know. I don't know. They're getting too little. I don't know. It seems like we're getting too little. Hmm. This is selamectin. Uh, this came up actually, Kate, when I talked to you because I said that uh, we should p perhaps give selamectin to the dogs uh, uh, that you were talking about for the C Katrina dogs. I said we should perhaps use selamectin rather than, because you said you couldn't use a, uh, interceptor to protect the dogs and to knock down the microfilaria. And I said, why don't we use revolution? It's approved for use in microfilaremic uh, dogs. And uh, the hardworm guys wrote back and said, we had no data on selamectin. Well, I knew we did because it was on the label. And the FDA tends not to publish stuff without data. Uh, so, uh, but, so we didn't have time because we only had 24 hours to get that letter done, and so it wasn't worth fighting about. Okay, we just had to get the dogs into those people's houses, so that was a moot point. But there is data out there showing that you do get a knockdown of Mike Fleury with uh, Revolution as well. Uh, ProHard tablet dose, you guys don't remember the ProHard tablets at all. It was used at one microgram per kilogram. It prevented heartworms at one yeah. microgram per kilogram moxidectin. Okay, no, it was an oral tablet. But it did not seem to have any effect on uh, microfilaria, but that's all we have. Uh, injectable, once again, almost no studies. They do come back. This is that study I already showed you. Note that if you take the drug away, they pop back, and we see one coming up. And this is showing you that it's also happened with Charlie Courtney's studies. After he pulled away the drug, that very bottom line there, the orange line, shows you that after a period of time, they start to come back again. 
Well, after I did that study, I was a golden boy with the antigen people. They all loved me because it meant that whether you used HeartGuard or you used Interceptor, you were going to have to do an antigen test because microfilaria were destroyed by the products. So they loved me, okay? However, what all they were concerned about was the graphs and the fact that they went away. I have talked since 1992 about my fear that if you transfer those dogs on those worms on the right to dogs, that you have kept under this selective pressure for months, those are the worms that are going to create resistance. And I've said nothing but since 1992. Okay, I feel like a bit of a flop because I've been telling people not to do what they're doing, and they and I have failed. Okay. Multi has received a micro, microplericidal claim. It's out there. I've tried to go to the F. I know it's been approved. Uh, they were closed. It came back. You remember the government was closed. It came back. They have received a claim. Uh, I, this, you look at the blue ones here. Are the, these are two treatments. It's a different scale. Now it just goes to 50 days or something on the bottom. Uh, we see that they got two treatments with multi. They went almost completely negative within 10 days, and they stayed negative after that second treatment. And then, uh, so this is shortening it up for you again. And then we followed a percentage of these dogs. There were two cohorts. And part of the second cohort, we followed for all uh, 350 days. And as you can see, even after those two treatments, they did not bounce back. OK? So there was no recrudescence, and they didn't bounce back. There are some problem microfilaria out there. You guys may have heard of the one published by uh, Dr. Peregrine at Guelph. Uh, he had a dog. We, we've had the Cornell. They come in, they get treated for harm, and we can't make the microfilaria go away. So that's what uh, Andrew up there dealt with up at uh, OBC. If you look at this dog, this dog was a Katrina dog, and it came up there, and it was pet check positive and nots positive. This was paid for by the owner. It then got the three dose regimen for heartworm treatment, okay? And then they gave it milled mycinoxine, and it was still nots positive. Then they gave it a heart guard, it was still nots positive. Then they gave it uh, 200 micrograms per kilogram ivermectin, the therapeutic dose, it was still not positive. Must still have heartworms, they said. So they treated it again. Two more, two more shots of arsenic, and then they gave milmycinoxime, and it was still not positive. And then they gave it 200 micrograms per kilogram ivermectin, and it was still not positive. Now they're going to move it over to Guelph. So that was all, that was half of 2008, and now we're moving into 2009. They move it over to the uh, wealth now and every other week the thing is getting interceptor. Nothing is happening. Then they give it the maximum dose band of interceptor every remember it's five to point it's it's point five to one. So they say let's max it out. So they gave it the one and uh oh it was still it was snap negative now it's been snap negative. The people at the university was convinced that there weren't any worms there anymore. We have to remember microfilaria we've proven through trans Fusion live at least two years after transfusion. So what we have in this dog are a bunch of microfilaria that are circling around, bathed in milbomycinoxine every two weeks. Then they wanted to make them go away. You can tell the university is involved because now they're counting them. They're trying to see how many are there. So uh, it's thyroid check positive, now it's positive, pet check I mean negative, uh, pet check negative, thyroid check negative. They then gave it milbomycinoxine at twice the maximum dose daily for seven days, it did not go away, and then they did it again for another week, and they went back up again, okay? You have to remember that microfilaria gets sequestered in the body, and they can come out and go back into various places that they hide, and so they're not always circulating at the same numbers in the blood. And don't forget what I told you about Pulaski's dog, okay? Pulaski's dogs had already undergone a trial before she did that, okay? Now a little bit of molecular biology. No sleeping, okay? <laughs> ATP binding cassettes, the AB transporter inhibitors, this is what we're talking about. And these, uh, these, are, uh, these are slides were made by Catherine Bourgeonat of McGill University, so they're much cuter than mine, and they're animated and cute, okay? So I don't do this, okay? So there's your pump. That's how they usually get stuff out of the brain. They pump it out, okay? And then if you stick something in there that blocks it open, they go through, and then they go to the brain, and then you get the disease, okay? And then, in collies, we have that four base pair deletion. Four! Four bases! That's it, okay? That's all.
and this stuff goes through and you kill the collie. It is unbelievable. Okay, molecular biology matters, believe it or not. Okay? <laughs> Things get around it. We know this from bacteria. Remember, erythromycin is a macrocyclic lactone, a, a macrolide, okay? So these things are in there. So they've gone into bugs. They look at this. We have PGP here. And now what you can do, if you don't want to do it, you get, you get better at pumping. So this thing can pump out a whole mo a lot of molecules faster. The other way that these bacteria do is they put a whole lot more cells into the uh, pumps into the wall, and then they can pump more out. So that's how it works, okay? So up there, they've been looking for resistant markers. She's done them, okay? She has some, and using the worms that we collected this summer, she has much better markers. They've also got the entire sequence now for the heartworm, and so they're getting pretty fancy with this stuff. But she did this early on using her markers for PGP, tubulin, and heat shock proteins. These are things that are associated with resistance in other creatures. And so she took, this is the hardy Weinberg equilibrium on the bottom, so don't ignore that. Basically, what we're looking at, whether or not they all have, uh, what we're looking at is whether or not they have different color eyes. We're trying to see if there's green eyes in the room, brown eyes in the room, uh, blue eyes in the room, hazel eyes in the room, then gray eyes in the room. Okay? That's what we're looking for. And if they do, they're on both sides of the line. And so using these worms out of a freezer that were old worms where we didn't have any pressure applied from U.S. laboratories, they have both color eyes. They have many different colors of eyes. Then they did old field eyes. They went to places like, and they took worms out of coyotes in places where they don't have uh, any drugs being applied. They had both color, many colored eyes. And then they went to Japan, old isolates from Japan in the field. Japan has used macrocyclic lactones about as long as we have, but using the Japan ones, the same thing, okay, multicolored eyes. But then she looked at Byron's. They all had the exact, they all had lost, they had an excess of homozygosity. Theoretically, they have lost their susceptible genes. Byron also showed at his study this summer that using the molecular markers, what he did was he gave dogs increasing doses monthly of ivermectin, okay, kept cranking it up, and he proved that he actually reduced the susceptible markers in those microfilarians. Okay, because what was circling more and more were microfilaria that were possible, more and more resistant. Okay, <laughs> and so, and these same markers were also shown to be associated, like with the ProHard six worms I had, with the worms Ronald had, uh, and the worms Pulaski's microfilaria from Pulaski's dogs. The new markers she has are very much associated with those as well. Gene flow and heartworms, there's a group, these guys, I can't remember where they're from. They're either from the American Museum of Natural History, the New York Museum of Natural History. They don't have a drug company fight, okay? These are NSF kind of people, right? They're nice people. They, they're probably, you know, okay, they're just pleasant folks. They aren't uh, selling out to anyone uh, except perhaps the people that review their grants. And so their genetic evidence is persuasive, okay? They believe there's four major groups of heartworms in, in North America. We have the ones in California, the ones in Wisconsin, the ones in Mexico, and the ones in the coast of the United States from uh, Florida on up to New Jersey, okay? I think Wisconsin's the same, but they, their genetics says otherwise, okay? And basically, they've got all this stuff marking gene flow from one to the other, saying there's very little gene flow with California that's going on. Uh, it's a little higher for what goes on with Wisconsin and for various reasons with barriers, et cetera. We don't have a lot of flow going on with Mexico. It makes some sense, folks. It's hard to get across the mountains if you're a dog. Uh, it wasn't until recently that heartworms got out there, so heartworms really didn't spread out of the delta until the highway system got built. I mean, Eisenhower probably caused the spread of heartworms, uh, and I'm not the first person to say that. Dr. Ron Colley did from Italy. It's true. I'm not kidding, okay? Uh, people could move their dogs. You could, before, you used to have to get on a bus or a train, and they'd say, no dogs. Once you got your own car and you can go anywhere you want, the world changed. Uh, the other thing that happened is uh, people left the, uh, were able to move much more easily. Gene flow. So they said in an area where there is a significant amount of gene flow, such as the Gulf Coast, the dispersal drug-resistance alleles would occur rapidly. Those resistant alleles would not necessarily need to arise in that geographic region, but could arrive there via dispersal from some other area. You're going to have people tell you that there's refugia out there. 
okay, that they use all you guys that study sheep worms, you talk about refusia, the cow guys talk about refusia, etc. When the worms are all in one dog, there is no refusia. There isn't any in that dog. A dog becomes a single pasture. There's millions of microfilaria in that dog, and you kill all the ones except you transfer with a mosquito. All the others died, just like those dogs that Andrew had, okay, just like Pulaski's dogs. These are the sites, folks. This is where the worms I just talked to you about. We had Earl, Arkansas, West Monroe, Louisiana, two more from Louisiana, and one from Athens, Georgia, Keatsville, Missouri, Mechanicburg, Virginia. And if you're telling me that is locked up in the Delta, unfortunately, Virginia does not happen to be in the Mississippi Delta. And uh, uh, Athens, Georgia, which is where MP3 came from, happens to be in the, what's it called, the Piedmont drainage system of Georgia. It is not in the Mississippi Delta. And the ones in Missouri, yes, they're in the Mississippi Delta, but they're up, uh, they're up there getting towards Minnesota. I think it's slow kill. So this is why you shelter guys have to pay attention to me. I don't know what to do, but I'm telling you we have a problem. I met a shelter veterinarian at NABC. He says he treats more than 5,000 dogs by just starting them on monthly ivermectin and sending them out the door. Clients have heard about it, and they ask to have it instead of the expensive imidacide treatment. That's what happens when they walk into a practice. Slow kill is a bad, bad, bad idea. I believe you should test dogs before you start them on prevention. I believe you should test dogs annually to avoid any MP3, any JD2009, any JYD34 sneak through. I think you should treat dogs with imidacide whenever possible if they're well enough to take it. Dogs should be on year-round prevention. I think having dogs on prevention is better than not having them on prevention. I think veterinarians have to impress upon clients the importance of keeping current, and veterinary practitioners must practice careful record keeping. So test dogs, test dogs, uh, and treat dogs, okay? I published an article called Why Heart and Preventive Sales Should Not Go Over the Counter. One of the reviewers of this article wrote back on the review and said, Bowman has created his own straw dog so he can knock it down. There is no way the FDA would ever allow these to go over the counter. So, not long after it came out, I was at a meeting, and there were FDA personnel at the meeting, and they said, keep it up. We're under huge pressure to go OTC with these products. You guys know that, that now that rule is no longer in Congress. It has gone to the, Fair, the Fair, Federal Fair Trade Commission. It is now going to be done not by legislation, but by regulation. If somebody gets up tomorrow morning and decides it's going to go OTC, nobody can do anything about it. You gave, when that moved out of, into a committee and out of, the, out of the legislature, it is not necessarily a good thing. And think about slow kill if you're a practitioner. If you're practicing slow kill, why are you going to test dogs before you start preventive? What are you going to do if they're positive? You're going to start them on ivermectin. Why test dogs before you're going to put them on prevention? Okay, they're safe. It says so right on the label, so why are you going to start them? Okay, just put them on preventive. Why are you going to check to see if they're infected with heartworms anyway? Because well, how are you going to treat it? You're going to put them on a monthly. So tell me where the veterinarian is in that equation. There's absolutely no veterinarian in the slow kill equation whatsoever because you've removed every reason to have a veterinarian. And I'm all done, okay? And I'll open it up to you guys, because I know that you guys have huge problems with what are you gonna do about positive dogs? Everybody go away. <laughs> no, so, <laughs> that, a bit of a delay. this is uh, Julie Levy, and a great presentation um, and so my question back to you is, <laughs> what are we going to do about those positive dogs? We, I think shelter veterinarians don't dispute any of the uh, evidence that's coming out, and we know what we would love to do. And we also know that sometimes there's a disparity in the resources that we have. And so, you know, we have some shelters that have no veterinarians at all, ever. Um, we have 
shelters that have a health care budget of $5 per animal, and that's got to include vaccination and neutering and everything else that's going to happen. And we're, we really are honestly looking for which of the bad choices is the best one for us to make and, and hoping the experts can help us walk that fine line. Yeah, I'm just, it's tough. I've thought about it a lot. I don't know what to do. I think it's going to get... <laughs> I think it's going to get harder and harder based on stuff I know. It's going to get harder and harder to make the Mike Flurry disappear. Okay? So I don't think you have a panacea out there that you can say that you're going to give them such and such and make it go away. Doxy may be an answer, but Doxy is unbelievably expensive now, too. Uh, the other one, out, what's the other one out there? It starts with M. Minocycline. Yeah. Minocycline. So you have another one. Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, it's not a grand possibility. You guys have to remember that you're under. If anybody gets a slightly resistant uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever case, no matter how much doxycycline they use to give every person who gets bitten by a tick, they're still going to blame veterinarians for creating it. And they're going to yank your doxy because you know they hate you and you're an easy scapegoat. And so that, you can pretend otherwise, but that's the truth. And so they're going to blame any resistance on you if they possibly can. And so that's what's going to happen. So doxy's okay, but that is, it's problematic. I think doxy's one thing you can do. I think recommending screens everywhere is a simple thing. Folks, I can find a, a shelter, maybe not so much now, but I visited sewage treatment plants 30 years ago. And how do you, where are sewage treatment plants? Sewage treatment plants in every single town are at the low point of town because when you flush the toilet, the water runs downhill. It's a pretty simple thing. If I wanted, if I went into a strange little town and I could do it still today, and I actually I did it not too long ago just to make sure it still works. If you go into a little town and you want to find the sewage treatment plant, follow the sign for the shelter. <laughs> yeah. They are owned, many of them historically are on public land, and they're as close as you can get to the lowest part of town. They're in Mosquito Heaven is where they had built all the shelters uh, in the United States of America. So I think screens would be a great thing. If nothing else, screens on the shelters where you're holding them. But to recommend people do slow kill is, I don't want to call it malpractice, but it's almost mispractice you're putting the risk of everybody else that owns a dog at more risk than they would be otherwise. And so I don't know how to help you, but I think it's a, it's a conversation. The main reason I wanted to have this call is to make certain that the conversation begins with you guys. And I wanted to try to convince you of the need to really try to rally around this and try to come up with something to do. If you're going to do slow kill, why not do it with oral ivermectin? Why not make the person come in for an injectable ivermectin at 50 micrograms, and you could check them. If these are people that can't afford it, it's going to be cheaper to give the dog a shot, and they can pay you by the shot, and you can check to make sure the mic flare go away. I mean, really. I mean, there are other ways to do it that don't involve just sending them home with something which we know isn't going to work. You have to figure out how to stay involved and seeing to it the Mike Flurry go away. And if you just send them out the door, I think, I hope, I, those studies were done in 92 and they didn't go away. Okay? They're not going to go away now, which is, what, 30 years later? 20 years later? I don't know. A lot later. Okay. 22? 20 years. So what else, guys? Can I this is this Sandra. I have a question just in terms of waiting to start preventative until you test. Um, there's a lot of shelters that, and this goes back to recommendations I was given, and I'm trying to remember, um, but from the Heartworm Society where it was understood that it would be better to start the preventative right when the animal came into the shelter even if you weren't going to test until, say, a week later or two weeks later, because you may get the benefit of treating back for a, a more recent infection. I sort of understand what you're saying, but it, it, I don't think it makes any sense, especially if you're only talking about a week. 
Okay, the whole reach back thing was talking about two months, three months. I don't think it's a good plan to go down uh, in terms of that. Uh, I think it all leads into the same thing as it was all, you gotta remember the Harm Society gave up checking for resistance until the FDA told them they had to. Uh, the FDA came to them and said, guys, you're not checking every year anymore. We want you to check again because we think there's a resistance problem. Uh, and so they were, they were concerned about the fact that by not checking, they were allowing this problem to get worse. And so uh, it's, a, it's there. And so, no, I would just go ahead. I would check first. Uh, the reason not to is, once again, leading you straight down the path to slow kill. And slow kill, I tell you, has nothing to do with having a veterinarian. You could... If you're going to do everything that way, just sell it out of PetSmart, okay? Really, get out of the business of making any money from these products. That's okay if that's what you want, but that's what's going to happen. And so you don't think, you know, say a month of having a dog on a preventive is worth it for a shelter that maybe can't afford to test? So you're going to get the dog in, you're going to give it one pill and then send it out? That's what I'm asking, yeah, so if that's what they do. Is that what you're going to do? I mean, you're doing it to protect it while it's in your shelter, but you're going to send it out to somebody who may or may not be protecting it? I'm just trying to... Is that what we're doing? Sometimes that's what they're doing because they actually don't have staff that can draw a blood sample or run a test. Like, literally, there's these yeah. little shelters that all they have are police officers that feed the dogs. Right, so the question is, we, off, you're saying the recommendation to to not give a preventative at all. So if you can't test, don't give the preventative. Right, but I'm saying if you're if you're giving a preventive, if you're giving a preventive the day it comes, that is going to treat it for the worms it had before it got there. Okay, if you're worried about it getting infected while it's at your shelter, you have to give it one 30 days after it's been there. Well, right, but presumably most of these dogs, we hope, aren't staying for a month. Maybe they are. But so that's the question. Put screens on your windows and stop using any drug. Put screens on your runs. That's what the guy did in, in, um, in Arkansas who... The guy that raised all the dogs, it was one of the first guys that started the huge complaints out there because he was raising all these fancy hunting dogs. They're all getting infected. I don't remember the guy's name, but if I was a southerner, I would because everybody knows him. Uh, and he was getting all those, and he was actually paying a veterinarian to come in and dose the dogs because he was giving them the monthly, and they were still getting infected. So then he hired a veterinarian to come in and dose the dogs, and they were still getting infected. And so basically what he's done is just screened everything in and said, to heck with it all. I don't know why your screen's cheap. And you put it up once, you don't have to buy it every the year. The animals are coming to you already infected. If the animals are coming to you already, already infected, infected, but you're only going to keep them a month, mm -hmm. and then you're going to put them out the door. Mm -hmm. So then, what are the screens accomplishing? So what? No, what are you accomplishing by? So you're giving the person an infected dog. I'm not. No, I understand why you're not in favor of the one. Month no, no. So I'm saying what they I don't come. understand is what the screens are doing. They're protecting the dogs from being infected while they're on your property. Yeah, I mean, that answers the question that I was asking. So they're, already, so they're already infected, then what are you doing? Why are we building screens, though? Well, now you'll keep them from infecting the dogs that live around the shelter. Yeah, I mean, as you said, if a lot of shelters are in low-lying places, and I've seen the same thing, too, there's lots of shelters that are swarming with mosquitoes. Obviously, so I'm saying if the dog like in there, infected, if the dog in the comes shelter, with my friend in it, I question okay, whether that's you're really not going to kill the adults by having by giving it a pill. So you're saying you're worried about the dog which has been infected within the last two months. That's what I'm. That's all I'm treating the dog that got infected within the last two months. Right. Right, like but I mean that that could be significant, right? The dogs who got infected in the last two months. Yeah, you know, I'm sure if talking about I June had, in had, Louisiana. Had, yeah, but I'm saying if I had to choose all the stuff I was spending my money on, would that be it? Well, they're probably using Ivermectin. You're Ivo keeping it for three weeks, Anything and then expensive. you're telling me you're going to keep it for three weeks and then give it to somebody. 
and then they're going to have to deal with whether or not it's infected anyway, right? Because you're not going to check. Or you might check at the time the animal is being adopted. A lot of shelters do that. Or you tell gonna... the adopter to check after they've adopted the dog. So again, if it comes to you infected, there's not much you can do about it. I mean, you're going to treat it with that pill that will kill it for two months worth of worms. That is a possibility, but I'd still have it behind screens because if you're not checking it, how do you know it doesn't have Mike Flair and putting all your other dogs at risk? Work has come That's out. That's my question, though. So would you, I mean. Work has come out most recently. Work has come out of Arkansas by Tanya McKay showing that if you have dogs in a facility that have heartworms, the best way to get the infection is to be near them and be a mosquito. Because mosquitoes don't fly when their belly's full. All they want to do is get a blood meal, go sit down somewhere and make eggs, and then uh, go lay them, and then they'll come back and feed again. They don't go along. We know the same thing with malaria. People that get bitten by malaria, often the mosquitoes don't fly that far after they bite. And so you're asking to infect the other dogs in your kennel if you don't put on screens unless you're going to give them all a pill. And then we're back right where we said because they're all, if they're coming in with Mike Flurry, then you're going to be transferring between your dogs Mike Flaherty, that you've already treated with an ivermectin to see to it that the only ones that are being transferred are the ones that have already seen ivermectin. I don't see how this is any different than practice. Am I? I think. No, I realize I'm not helping you guys. I'm not trying to help you guys necessarily. <laughs> I'm trying well, to we need help, <laughs> and we I want help. To, but you, but I need help. You know, it's hard. <laughs> yes, it is. I don't know what the answer is. I'm just telling you that it's not simple, and it's not as simple as just starting every dog on preventive and saying we have handled the problem because we started them all on preventive, because that's not handling the problem. And I think that's where you know, we totally agree that we know it's in an inadequate response. We're just looking for the least inadequate response, and, and sometimes it's at the level of, can we give adulticide therapy? Sometimes it's a level of can we give preventative or sometimes it's a level of can we test or not? And just when the answer is no to one or more of those, what's our best move? Because we have to make a move. We, well, we you you know, know, Doing nothing move. is making a move too. Right, and I think, I, I think sometimes the question is which is the lesser of two evils? So is it is it a lesser evil to give nothing to dogs at intake if you can't. So if we know that it's a given, you can't test them, is it worse to give them preventative or not give them preventative? And to me, it, it sort of seems like it's worse to not give them preventative. And that's what I'm asking, because it sounds like you're saying you think it's worse to give them preventative. No, what I'm saying is if I had the facility screen. Yeah, but, I mean, the, the same facility that can't do the heartworm test, they're also not going to be able to screen their facility. Dogs that are positive. Like, so that part, that I mean, we're talking about something you have to do that once a year. Max, and then you just have to so, slap some more screen on the, you know, on the screen that got broken because it got busted. But you're going to cut down, in these areas, you're going to cut down huge amounts of mosquito bites by just a little bit. of It's cheap. Nice. Well, but they also take walking. dogs outside on walks, you know, to get them out of their kennels. Yeah, and well, that'll be so. minimal by comparing it sitting there all night long and getting bitten. So be, I'm just saying, it would to me, it'd be an easy place to start to make a difference. Why do the question, we know, the question will still come? Millions you know, of bed nets. Why do some of your children sell buy bed nets to sell to Africans in school? Because we know that if you stop the mosquitoes from biting. You can make a huge difference, and it's as simple as buying some cheap bed nets yeah, and draping really them over the stuff. Same with, like, an and I know some of you have supported the bed net movement because it's a huge movement. I've got students on Cornell campus going to Africa to pass out bed nets, okay? And it's coated with permethrin, and if they thought about it for 30 seconds, they would all be uh, horrified. But they're all anti bed Yeah, so yeah. that's what we're doing. So I'm saying it works. 
It's a simple thing which has made a huge difference in terms of malaria control around the world and human filariasis control as well. Can you also comment on, so adulticide therapy, if, um, you know, we would like to do aminocide and, and there are shelters that do lots of aminocide and there's shelters even that do three-dose treatment protocols with aminocide, but then there's the ones, again, that have a couple cops working there and there's no way they're going to do aminocide and we can recommend that they go to their vet and do it, but they may or may not. So if a minicide is off the table or, or just goes off the market for a while and we don't have the choice to use it, what should we do? You're probably going to have to do something that involves a doxycycline microbe okay. if you want to suppress the microflurry. So even though you said that really quietly, it's like our best worst or yeah, our best bad choice would be a slow kill with doxycycline and a macrocytic lactone. Yeah, but I don't think it's gonna last you forever. Yeah. I I know I think, I, I, would agree. I think that we are I think that I mean the question is, are you guys I mean, the other thing you guys could do is stop moving dogs. And I've said this repeatedly. I know I make you mad, okay, but I'm not here to necessarily make you happy. Uh, I'm just here to talk about it. I mean, you guys are moving all these southern dogs all over the United States of America. You tell me I have a shortage of puppies up here in the north, so therefore you got to get southern dogs to, to, to sell because, I mean, to keep your business open, you have to have dogs to move. you got to help out the southerners because they're making too many dogs. But what you're doing is you're moving huge. You know, the dogs we see at Cornell University that have heartworms the come dogs are killed a in shelter. Them. Not a That's where they're coming from. And so that would be something else, which I know you don't like, but, I mean, if you're going to move dogs, I've even talked to someone actually in Washington about would it be possible to make it so you could move dogs to California if they were positive. Europe, you cannot move dogs into Germany. You cannot move dogs into Sweden if they're heartworm positive. Okay? Should we have state rules? Should I talk to the state of New York and say, we're going to stop you from coming in? If I was in Maine, that's what I would do. I would just. So I'd be curious I, I, about the group. How do you feel about that, the shelter group? No, you don't like the idea. He already knows how I feel. <laughs> Somebody else out there has to speak up. <laughs> well, I, think one I know of the things exactly I think how you about. feel. I'm, but I'm just telling you, if if it was a human disease, no one would be fighting yeah. with me. If I had foot long worms living in the lungs of six year olds in Louisiana that might get in your lungs of your six year old in Maine or Oregon, do you think anybody would be fighting with me at all? No. No, and I'm actually they, they might be if the children in Louisiana were gonna die. You know, if lots and lots of children in Louisiana were going to die if you didn't move them. But I don't like like seriously you could quarantine dogs for a month and get three doses of imidacide into them. Like, I don't know. You, I, I don't think it would be horrible to say that you can't transport dogs that have active heartworm infection. Yeah. The puppies, yeah. I presume, you're going to let us ship them yep, because we can't test them yet. So those are the ones that really matter for the northward migration. So I, I think the sheltering field would probably be split on whether that was reasonable. We're very acutely aware that moving infectious diseases around the country is getting cracked down on, and if we don't get our act together doing it, we're going to find many doors to states slam shut, and we don't want that. And so we're the whole transport industry is going to need to tighten up. Yeah. I think the reality, though, is in terms of dog movement from state to state, shelter transport remains trivial. Compared to um, all the, or you mean compared to pets? People, people yep. drive the, around with dogs in their cars. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you can focus on the shelter transport because it's organized and sort of acknowledged and, you know, no doubt worth um, identifying best practices around that. But I think, you know, if we actually look at the percentage of dogs moving around the United States in people's cars, and that was really the huge migration that happened after Katrina. The number of dogs that were shipped by shelters was trivial compared to the number of people that just fled with their families in the back of station wagons. And these are the same dogs that end up in shelters with their heartworm infections. The U.S. military, according to one of my students who's in the Army, the U.S. military now makes it, it is against 
the rules of the military to move a dog between bases with an active heartworm infection. <laughs> so the U.S. military has made and they made it because of Germany. That's <laughs> why, because they were getting in trouble in Germany by taking infected dogs, there. and so that's why. But they made a blanket statement. So now moving dogs between bases. So they thought that it was worth considering. But yeah, you know, really so they ran up against the problem that when they went to Germany, I Germany has that rule that you can't do that. Well, and in theory, at least, you are supposed to have a health certificate signed by a veterinarian in order to cross over state lines, which does say infectious diseases. And if we were really doing it, we would be testing for infectious mm -hmm. diseases prior. But obviously, we don't have border patrol between Pennsylvania and New York. But in reality, I mean, that is expected. No one does it. This is Amy. Can I just ask, too, what, what you would recommend is the best surveillance method for being able to track over time if we're getting increasing resistance? Because it does seem kind of like we, we look at random cases of resistance and it's hard to tell when it's a trend or when we're, we're dealing with an increasing problem or just more awareness. Well, there, I'm, on the, I'm on the far fringe that I say we're way beyond talking about it. We're way beyond having it. People will say things like, why hasn't it spread? I will tell you the reason. Why haven't we seen even more of it lately? I think the reason is because we have people doing things like giving all their dogs doxy in practice, people that will give dogs a uh, heart guard on the first of the month and a 50 micro to make sure they get their guarantee, and on the 15th of the month they get oral ivermectin at 50 micrograms per kilogram. Uh, we have people that are giving multi and intercepts. All those things are going because we have veterinarians out there in the field who have been faced with clients that want to go somewhere else, and they have done everything they can to see to it that they're making their they're protecting their clients' pets. So I think we're way beyond. Is it out there? I showed you the map. I think we're going to see more. We may have a little hiatus. There's other stuff I know about that is indication that there is more that just isn't talked about. Uh, so. Will it show up? I don't know. I mean, the trouble about resistance is you never care about it until it shows up in your backyard. You know, I, that's the way the world works. It's only the humans relative to Artemisia resistance right now in malaria. If Artemisia resistance shows up in somewhere in Thailand, 30,000 doctors without borders descend in there like a, their own plague, and they treat everybody, <laughs> and they see to it that it goes away. We're working on monitoring systems. Novartis was actually spending some time trying to get a monitoring system involved. Uh, there are people talking, Dr. Geary at McGill has suggested that we could use a simple, give it 50 micrograms per kilogram ivermectin, have the microfilaria don't go away, consider it resistant, and that you that would be his thought. That's one possibility. Blackburn has <laughs> talked about being able to screen them in his assay, but that takes that's a little bit too hard. So those are the kind of things we're hoping to set up sometime in the next year or two. But the trouble is, I don't know how fast it'll come or how fast it'll be accepted. Don't forget we have to, it took the science five years to catch up with the veterinarians. The veterinarians were all saying we have resistance, we have resistance, and it took scientists five years to prove that they had exactly what they said they had. And so I think we're gonna see it move. There will people be people tell you that it's not going to spread. Uh, Ray Kaplan at George is one of the guys who's going to say it's not spreading, and I, he and I just totally disagree. We both know it. We like each other, but you know he has his opinion and I have mine. He will gladly give you a talk, tell you why there may be resistance, but it's never going to go anywhere. I think he's just wrong. That's why I talk to the refuse like because he talks about a different kind of refusal. <laughs> Folks, I have to run yes. because I have to see somebody and I'm going to leave in town. I'm not trying to be rude, but I really uh, I have a graduate student I have to meet. I do want to thank you a whole lot for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. I mean it. I really wanted to make sure that I got to you guys and talked to you. I think you're a critical part of this whole thing, and I'm sorry I just couldn't come in here and give you an answer. But uh, I think if you think about it for a while, we could probably get some more people to come back and talk to you again and try to come up with some kind of, now once, it, once the discussion starts, then you can actually come up with ideas and you can plug into a system to come up with some kind of uh, 
at least something that might uh, help a little bit here and there. Before you take off, just because you have access to industry, is one thing that's done in the third world in these situations is medication is made available to underserved communities. And so if imidacide was widely available to shelters, there would be a lot more infections cured. So I, I don't have a good idea about how that could work, but it would be something just to tuck away when you're talking to those is, types of people. The patent must be almost gone. So that would be the that would be the first thing. You know, I'm not sure I want to be the one that goes gets free R stick for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I'll take the hit. So anyway, yes, I will look at how what the patent date is. That would be the first thing. And I don't know how, my understanding is it's expensive to make, but they always say that. Prosequanto was expensive to make mm -hmm. till it went off patent, and then it was, all of a sudden <laughs> you could have enough to treat a horse, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, right. <laughs> it's hard to figure it all out. Has anybody ever talked about bringing back um, Caparsolate? Yes. Uh, not that one, no. People have talked about other things. People, you, can, uh, you can get rid of most of the males by giving... Uh, this was done by Brad Bradley uh, down in Florida, uh, oh, mid 70s. He actually showed you can get rid of most of the males in dogs, which would ultimately have the effect of stopping breathing if you gave them labamazole for extended periods of time. Yeah. And so there's talk about doing that kind of stuff again. Mm -hmm. uh, and putting but we dogs knew on work. Mm -hmm. I, used, you know? I used to have. Back before imidacide, we used to get all the rescue dogs together and have a horrible weekend. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, you got them all done in one shot, and most of them did okay. I don't know if it's still around. The trouble is if you stop manufacturing something for yeah. a certain number of years, the United States of America, you have to get it reapproved. Sure. So I dealt with a ear mite product that they had actually two companies merged and they forgot to make it. Okay, it was just that simple. They literally forgot to make it for three years. They wanted to bring it back. It turned out it was going to be so expensive to bring it back that they actually had to give it up because they had to go through all the approval process. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. As always. Thanks, Dwight.